So we're very happy to welcome back Elaine <laughs> Chiron and Darren Scott today. Well, Scott, sorry, Darren. Darren LaScott today. Elaine is a professor emerita from the University of Minnesota and the former Carla director. And Darren is a teaching specialist in the MELT program and in the Department of French and Italian. And today they're going to talk about their research on narrative voices, learners shift accuracy and fluency in protagonist speech. So please welcome Elaine and Darren. Thank you. So, uh, this is a presentation Darren and I, it's an extended form of a presentation Darren and I gave at the AAAL conference and at TESOL last spring. And it's a really we love this. We love this study, so we thought we'd do it again one, one more time. Um, the focus of the presentation is not on overall proficiency of second language learners, but rather it's more fine-grained as all second language acquisition research is. So it we're really focused on the development and use of specific grammatical patterns, such as plural marking, past tense marking, gender, and so on. In other words, this is the level of the learning objectives that you write in a lesson plan, right? So, uh, and what we want to know is what grammatical structures second language learners actually use when they're creating meaning, as opposed to consciously practicing grammar structures in the classroom. So when you look at that, that as a definition of what we're interested in, in the development of grammatical structures that are actually used to communicate meaning, is that a process that's just in your brain? Is it cognitive only? And is that process of learning unaffected by social context? And there are theorists who say, right, that's, that's what it is. Uh, learning is about the brain. The brain is about cognition. And cognition is not affected by social context. I do not agree with that. We do not agree with that. Uh, we are with a growing number of researchers who argue that the acquisition of these grammatical patterns, yes, it is cognitive, but it's also affected by social and sociocultural context. Things like the identity of the learner. Who does the learner uh, feel that they are? What is their social role? The interlocutors, the people that they're interacting with, um, situational dynamics, and so on. So these are sociocultural and variationist theories of second language acquisition. And <clears throat> I'm citing some examples of studies on both sides of that divide. Um, basically, the variation, as a variationist, I've argued for decades now that um, these grammatical patterns shift over time in different social situations. And I, you, I noticed it first when I was a teacher that we would, and this is back in the day of audiolingualism, when we would be working on a grammatical pattern in a language lab and students would get it right, walk out the door, and the minute they were talking about anything meaningful, boom, it was gone, right? So this is a no-brainer for a teacher, that there are these shifts in the grammatical patterns that your learners produce depending on where they are and what they're doing. So. There are, and I'm just going to describe the study that I did in 1985, I did a small study looking at four English morphemes, that third person singular S verb, plural S uh, on nouns, suppliance of any article, definite or indefinite, uh, in obligatory context before a noun, or direct object pronoun, it. Right. So those are morphemes you were looking for. And then we uh, I targeted those in three different tasks. First, grammaticality judgment test. It's a written grammar test on, on those specific morphemes. Uh, an interview, oral interview with the researcher. And then oral narration of a story where there was a listener who needed the information for some purpose. So uh, those were the three tasks. And I arranged the task in terms of how much attention to grammar was required. Uh, here's an example of the findings. It was really clear. On this left-hand side is the gra written grammar test. That was least percentage correct. And these different lines, the solid one, you can't see very well, sorry. That one is the Arabic speakers learning English, and the dotted one is Japanese speakers learning English. Both of them were least um, 
least correct articles correct on that written test, um, more on the oral interview. No, it's the other way around. It's the other way around. Anyway, most accurate on the written grammar test, least accurate on describing objects to a learner. So task has an effect, also variation with interlocutor and topic. So subsequent studies by other people have shown that learners shift their grammatical forms uh, depending on who they're talking to, what the topic is, and a range of other factors. And I'll just cite two studies. One of them, Guo Qiang Liu, his dis doctoral dissertation followed a five-year-old boy over three years, um, native speaker of, Sp of Chinese and tracked his question formation in English, showing that each new stage, he moved up to a new stage, uh, differentially depending on who he was talking to. First, he used the new straight stage with a family friend who happened to be the researcher. Weeks later, he'd start using it with his peers in the classroom, last with his teacher. So again, his teacher was always the last to know that he <laughs> could do something new. And the reason for this, according to Liu, was he would only, he was being a good student. He was only showing his teacher something new when he was 100% sure that it was better, right? So it was a social and identity and role relationship kind of issue. Another study was Bronner's doctoral dissertation in a Spanish immersion, uh, fifth grade Spanish immersion class here in the Twin Cities. And she just looked at whether the students were using Spanish or English, just what language were they using, right? And she found very clear uh, data with the three learners she looked at, again, over time. The kids, when the teacher was near, the closer the teacher got, the more Spanish they used. When she's right there, they were speaking Spanish 100% of the time. She walked away, English started coming in. Uh, certain kids were, had the reputation in their classroom of being kids who use Spanish a lot. They all use more Spanish with that kid. And then when they were talking to each other about popular culture, movies, things like that, English. Right? So a number of factors, very clear, demonstrable, systematic variation. So it, you could say it was ruled down because it was predictable but it wasn't on, off. It was variable, depend, but influenced in a systematic way by social factors. So the question is, um, early on, Long, Michael Long, argued that this kind of situational shift was irrelevant to second language acquisition. Basically, the argument is situation affects what learners do, performance, but it doesn't affect what they know competence. So his argument was strictly competence performance. We're interested in changes in competence. It's very cognitive, right? But variationist researchers have in fact since documented that those shifts do affect order of acquisition, as in use, study, of specific grammatical structures, and they remain. They're there. They're in, they're in the cognition then of the learner with, uh, with social context attached. So they keep appearing or reappearing when the learner speaks in one context or another. So there is an acquisitional component here. It isn't just a matter of performance. So how then can we imagine that these acquired variable, some people call them variable rules, variable patterns, how do, how do they show up in learner's language? So um, long before modern variationist linguistics, sociolinguistics, and SLA, uh, Bakhtin, uh, a Russian sociocultural psychologist, talked about a phenomenon he called heteroglossia. And he, this is very important for him, he claimed that speakers of any language, not, he wasn't talking about learning, he just talked about any language, internalize a range of different voices. And what he meant by a voice is a set of linguistic and non-linguistic features, not just what you say, but how you move and, and how you present yourself. It's a holistic idea that certain people speak with have a voice. And the, the language is imbued with personality of specific speakers. And my favorite example of voice is, is that moment as a mother when, when you are, uh, you've sworn you're not going to do what your own mother did 
like scold your child in a certain tone of voice. And then the day comes when you're at your wit's end and suddenly you hear your mother's voice come out of your mouth. <laughs> and you are saying those words with those gestures, right? The whole thing is just like suddenly, ah! You know, I'm, I'm possessed, right? But it's that, that's what he's talking about. It's an unconscious thing. You've got these constellations. You have internalized them. You have learned them. You have acquired them unconsciously. And they reside in your cognition. And they're imbued with social context, right? So these are, this is what he meant by voice. So this seems relevant to us, right? This is really something we want to think about when we think about people learning a second language. Uh, Bakhtin talked about something he called ludic language play. So it's playing just for fun. And that's the way that you're, it's very imaginative. You're playing around with words, not to transmit a message, not to get a message across, but just because words sound funny, right? Uh, Bronner, uh, in, her, in her data, we went back and looked at her doctoral uh, dissertation data and wrote about this, showing that these fifth graders in the Spanish immersion classroom were, in fact, playing with language a lot. They were screwing around if you want to know. I mean that's another word for language play. They were they were they were playing with words and just to amuse themselves, just to have fun, right? So here's an example uh, from Leonard. Uh, one of the girls said, no hay recreo ahora, meaning there's no recess now. And Leonard immediately goes, ahora, ahora no hay recreo. Eh, 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 eh. Right? So I mean it's like that's language play, right? He's putting on the villain voice, and uh, that is not what his teacher said. He's not repeating what she said. He's creating a whole other persona through this use of voice that he's transferred into his Spanish, which is not his native language, right? And finally, the last bit of sort of theoretical background here before uh, Darren talks about our study is about constructed dialogue. And this is one way in which people these days um, talk with different voices. Um, you know, second language textbooks for years have talked about how you quote other people's words. So we have, what, direct speech, direct quotation, as in John said, comma, quote, uh, I'm coming in. Or indirect, John said that he was coming in, right? That's it. That's how you quote other people's words. But no, if you actually listen to what people do, and especially younger people do now, when they tell a story, they don't say those things, right? They use constructed dialogue. And here's some examples uh, from Mathis and Ewell. And these are not second language learners, but it it's, will be familiar to you. So one person said, I'm like, look, don't you... And the partner, who wasn't in this conversation that's being reported to her, chimes in with, no, 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 I don't mean it. I don't mean it. Right? <laughs> so now that's constructed dialogue, right? So it's not, what's important here is it's a creation. It's imaginative. It's maybe stereotypical, right? But it conveys a certain tone, right? So it involves not just words. It involves positioning. So when you do these positioning, when you report a conversation, you even shift to show who's talking, right, like this. So you're, you're acting it out, enacting the dialogue. So this is a form of language play. And we can expect, we believe, second language learners do this. Now, Darren, I'm going to transition now. It's going to be Darren's, uh, Darren's turn next. But Darren has spoken already at, at this Carla presentation about his MA study showing bilingual, fluent bilinguals in French and English doing this kind of thing. And what our study is that we're reporting on now builds on that foundational study. Yeah, yeah. Um, so in 2015-2016, I was actually taking a course with Elaine Tyrone on second language acquisition. And what we were learning about are these shifts in response to changes in the external objective social context. So change in interlocutor variation, right? Change in task variation. Um, but thinking about this theory of social culture theory and heteroglossia and internalized voices, what 
hadn't been extensively investigated yet was how people, perhaps when they're recreating through constructed dialogue, these stories, and they're no longer talking to their interlocutor, but telling them what they said to another person, right? Recounting these narratives, what happens when there's that imagined internal shift in social context. So I did this study uh, with two French bilinguals, uh, French L1, English L2, and they reenacted voices of other protagonists in their stories, and often they were native speakers of English. Um, at the time, they, the, these two participants were first year immersion school teachers um, at a Twin Cities immersion school. And so their conversations, their stories centered around what their students said, but also what their students' parents told them or emails that they would get from the students' parents. And when they were taking on the voice or reenacting the voice of a more proficient speaker, and in this context that happened to be a lot of native speakers, they would themselves be more accurate. So their accuracy improved, their fluency improved, and some times their complexity improved as well. So uh, this is, I'm just going to show two different examples um, that kind of shift in opposite ways. Um, the first is with Sylvie. Oh, that's cut off there a little bit. Um, but she was the least proficient of the two individuals. And when she was talking with her French interlocutor, Marine, Nine times out of nine, when she's telling about emails that she needs to send, um, emails that she received, she's mistakenly using the word mail in place of email. So she doesn't mean a letter sent by the post, uh, but email. Um, this isn't important for her to monitor, really, uh, because in French, mail means email. And so her French-speaking interlocutor would readily understand that she's not talking about sending letters. Uh, so nine times out of nine. You see a few different examples there, uh, but she uses mail in place of email. The only time in the entire 30-minute recording that she uses the correct word email uh, when she needs to in the same obligatory context is when she's no longer addressing Marine, but she's telling Marine what she said to a parent of one of her students who presumably does not speak French. And in that moment, it comes very important for her not only um, to use the correct word, but she's also adding qualifiers, right? So this example down here for the enacted voice. Um, I gave her an answer two weeks after, like, oh, I didn't check my professional email. I am a good teacher. <laughs> Don't worry. Right? So she's adding out some qualifiers there. Um, another example that actually goes in the opposite way that I thought was interesting for the study is what happens when people are taking on the voices of others who are perhaps less proficient than they believe that they are right in the language. And so uh, Marion did this um, a few different times in which she downshifted her accuracy when she was taking on the voice of someone else who was less proficient than she was. So in this example, we um, at the top I have a few questions that she used in her narrative baseline voice, um, a few different stage five questions. So we have WH fronting, do insertion. We don't have any errors with that. So what do you think? Does it work well? Or, oh, what do you want me to ask Jera? Um, but it's only when she's hearing the story of something that happened between Sylvie and a couple other people where someone spilled the beans of some secret Halloween costume idea that all the first grade teachers um, had planned. Um, where she said, Noah, it's a secret. And Maureen, who was not present in that top, uh, when that event actually unfolded, She's constructing dialogue. She's attributing speech to Sylvie, who's the less proficient of the two individuals from this original pilot study. She says, why did you do? And then Sylvie um, picks up as Noah. Oh, I didn't know that, how it's possible. Yeah. So here we see shifts in two different directions. One, an uh, increase in accuracy when you're taking on the voice of someone more proficient than you are. But then on the other hand, some downshifting, right? And so maybe you're thinking about how you take on other voices when you're pretending to be someone else. You can think about that in terms of accent, stance, and all of that as well. So uh, this study in 2016 led to a number of questions um, that sparked this larger study that Alain and I did together. So what does this kind of shift in complexity, accuracy, and fluency um, with enacted voices, does this kind of shift occur with other learners, right? Or did it just happen to be with these two randomly? 
or they were highly proficient bilinguals, what had happened with learners at a lower level. Yep, exactly. So then another one is, is this restricted to highly proficient bilingual speakers? Or in other words, at what stage of language learning do learners start to take on voices um, that are characterized by clear shifts in complexity, accuracy, and fluency? And what might such results suggest about the nature of interlanguage competence? So what do these learners actually know? Is it what's in these enacted voices? Is it just what's in the baseline narrative voice? Or maybe uh, something of the two. So our study explores the role of enacted voice in language play in the oral narratives of 10 adult learners of English as a second language. So we had 10 different adult learners who were studying at an intensive English program at the University of Minnesota at the time of data collection. And we tried to get a range um, in terms of who those participants were. So we had seven females and three males. They came from various language backgrounds, including Arabic, Chinese, Japanese, Korean, Russian, and Spanish. And their proficiency ranges were from high beginning to the most advanced of what was offered in the program age ranged as well. And uh, the data collection was one 20 to 40 minute interview with the researcher, um, so it was with me. And learners first watched a short clip, um, there's a screenshot of the clip that they watched, with actor Melissa McCarthy, who was telling a story about her daughter and her father and different shenanigans that took place um, on the Ellen DeGeneres show. And then following that, they were asked a few questions. And the intent of these questions was to get them to recount narratives, uh, perhaps taking on more than one role in the narratives, more than one voice. So one question was, Melissa talks about funny family situations where her daughter breaks rules. Have you ever broken a family rule when you were young? Who was involved and what happened? Uh, living in a new culture, there are some culturally specific rules that might be new for you. Tell me about a time when you broke a culturally specific rule. Who was involved and what happened? So uh, following these two prompts, uh, the participants all narrated uh, different stories using constructed dialogue where they were taking on uh, more than one role in the story, because I obviously could not uh, take on a role myself. Um, but they all had constructed dialogue. So um, looking specifically at those narratives, what we then wanted to do is distinguish between what was their narrative voice and then this enacted voice. Um, narrative we define as a verbal technique for recapitulating experience. So in particular, this is a technique of constructing narrative units that have a temporal sequence. Um, so basically telling a story, one or more of a series of events that has a central plot. And from that, once we had the narratives, we then distinguished what was enacted voice versus the narrative baseline voice. So enacted voice was determined by one of three criteria. The first would be direct quotation from of other speakers marked with reporting verbs or quotatives. So some of the examples that Elaine gave earlier with he said. The second is direct quotation attributed to other speakers using a zero quotative, and this was often accompanied by change in voice quality. So kind of like the falsetto voice that Elaine also did for us earlier today. And then the third was direct quotation attributed to oneself. When the speaker is using deictics, you or your, um, or the imperative mood, but they're no longer talking to the person across from the table. Uh, they're saying what they said to someone else. In order to analyze these in terms of complexity, accuracy, and fluency, we took both the enacted voice <laughs> units and the narrative baseline voice, and we analyzed them in terms of analysis of speech units, um, specifically <coughs> dividing them up by um, analysis of speech unit is an independent clause together with any subordinate clauses or subclausal units. And so um, here are a few different examples. The upright slash or bar uh, marks different AS units, or analysis of speech units. And then together with the double colon, uh, we have different subordinate clauses or subclausal units. So by doing this, we were able to analyze for complexity. Um, we are able to analyze for accuracy and also fluency.
So keeping those AS units in mind for complexity, we took the total number of separate clauses. Um, so it could be independent clauses, subclausal units, or subordinate clauses, and we divided that by the total number of AS units. So their speech was more complex the more clauses there were per AS unit. Okay, so this resulted in a whole number, and the higher the number was, the more complex the speech was. For accuracy, uh, we took the total number of errors and divided that by the total number of clauses to get a mean number of errors per clause. Um, so the higher the mean, the more inaccurate the second language production was um, in each respective voice. So the lower being more accurate. In addition to this more quantitative measure, we looked at the types of errors that the speakers were making in both their enacted voice and narrative voice to be able to talk about the differences we are seeing between the two. And then finally for fluency, we were looking specifically at hesitation phenomena. So uh, false starts, repetitions, reformulations, replacements, uh, we were taking the total number of those and then doing uh, a mean number of re repair fluency per clause. So again, the higher the rate, the more disfluent here. So just jumping right into the results, um, for accuracy, in the goldenrod color, we have their narrative baseline voice. And in the more maroon color, uh, we have the enacted voice. With all 10 participants going across the board, uh, our least proficient participants to the most proficient in terms of their scores, their placement scores. Um, and so what you can see here is that there's all this, for accuracy, they're all more accurate in their enacted voice in comparison to their narrative baseline voice. 10 out of 10 participants were more accurate in their enacted voice. Um, and we took uh, these numbers and we did an exact permutation analysis, so basic uh, statistical analysis to see how significant these findings were. And um, the p-value that we got from doing this exact permutation analysis was thanks to Bob Delmas over in the College of Education and Human Development was uh, 0.002, or highly statistically significant. And there's a couple of different examples that we have just to show what this looked like. Um, so not just looking at the quantitative measures, but the qualitative. So uh, one example in an immediate context is this uh, marking for plural S in the inactive voice. So Jing Fei, uh, one of our lower participants, lower level participants, uh, she's telling a story about this encounter she had with another student talking about how hot it is here um, versus how hot it is in their home countries. And we have her saying, um, she was talking to a student from Africa and I said, oh, we have like 13, no, 14 degree in cel Celsius in summer. And she said, oh my God, what are you talking about? We only have 28 degrees. And then she goes on to continue, it's the highest, the highest temperature in Africa is 28, and we have the average is 40 degree. All right, so in this 30 seconds that it took her to say this, she was marking for plural S only when she was taking on the voice of someone else. But going back to her own voice, she was no longer marking it. Um, like we saw with the pilot study, um, there was one case where even though uh, Lisa Veta, who is actually the lowest level of the 10 participants, even though overall her enacted voice was more accurate than her narrative baseline voice, like we saw with all 10 participants, she actually downshifted in her accuracy uh, a few times when she was taking on the voice of someone that uh, was less proficient than she was. So similar is what we saw with Malin. So in her narrative voice, uh, we only had one question uh, where she's um, talking about, well, it's in her own voice. Uh, so she says, why and exactly this wire? Um, but in her enacted voice, we see a lot more examples of questions. And we can see here when she's talking about herself or maybe taking on the American, we have more of those stereotypical, oh, how are you? The things you learn very easily. Oh, what do you want? Uh, that are without error. It is only when she's taking on the voice of Russian shopkeepers where she makes these errors with question formation. Why you don't buy anything, right? And even in the recording, she puts on a thicker 
more Moscow accent when she does this versus when she's talking to me just more normally. Uh, for fluency as well, uh, same sequence across from lower to higher proficiency. Narratives again in the goldenrod color. Um, for fluency as well, we see it with all but one, all but one person, and that one person is Judy. Um, all people are more fluent in their um, enacted voice as compared to their narrative voice, right? So the higher the number here, the more disfluent those speakers were. Um, again, doing an exact permutation analysis, with, thanks to Bob Delmas, uh, we had a slightly higher p-value, but still significant for a finding, that they were more, more fluent in their enacted voice. And we just pulled an example where you can kind of see why this might be. So for setting up the story, um, as these participants were trying to recount this narrative, set up the story, there was a lot of struggling to make sure the correct meaning got across, right? So they're, they're starting out with something, oh, that wasn't right, they're replacing it. Um, they're just trying to build up the story, and then they have their punchline, right? The moment that they're waiting to say. So we saw this is fairly common among all the participants where there is a lot of reformulations, replacements until you got to the enacted voice because that's what was in their mind of the thing that they wanted to tell you this story, the whole, the whole punchline for it. And for complexity, again, looking at the total number of clauses per AS unit, so higher the number, the more complex it was. We actually saw that because of this tendency to build up and include a lot of information in the narrative voice to get to that punchline, there's a lot more subordination in those. Um, so this finding was not significant. We had um, a p-value of 0 0.111, so not too far off. Um, but it looks like there's a trend where they're more complex in their narrative voice um, as compared to their enacted voice. And if you uh, do a lot of reading in terms of complexity, accuracy, and fluency, when you're looking at that um, framework, that tends to be the case. When you're more accurate or more fluent, your complexity tends to go down. If you're focused on complexity, you might have more errors. Um, and I think this is where I hand it off to you. Is that it? Oh. <laughs> okay. Um, and that was just that example. Okay, another example. Okay. Yeah, and you can see, you know, when you're telling a story, actually I, I'm dealing right now with a one, two and a half year old and the same thing happens there. Starting to tell a story and it's very, because uh, 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 um, they're trying to think while they tell the story. So there's a lot of disfluency. But, but the punchline is always, it's not my mouth, it's my aunt's mouth. It's, it comes out accurate and, um, and fluent. So, so what does this mean? Just to go back to those questions we were asking, do other second language learners, besides these two very fluent bilinguals, do they shift in complexity, accuracy, and fluency when, when they're doing constructed dialogue? So you needed to ask this. We only had two, two participants in that first study, and they were very fluent. So the question is, do other people do this too? And yeah, they did. And um, the participants, and just to review what, what Darren just said, more errors in their narrative segments than the enacted voice segments, that much more hesitation phenomena in their narrative, but, but much more fluent in the enacted voice. And um, there's no significant difference, a lot of variation in terms of complexity. Is it only proficient bilinguals who do this? And no. And I think this first thing is really important to say, all of the learners knew how to tell stories with constructed dialogue, right? They all did it. Like, I think of this as a very American young person phenomenon. They, and I was like, and he was like, and he's, and I'm. No, they all did it in their second language. So that's really kind of interesting. Something to think about when you're talking about how you quote other people, by the way, right? Because they, they all do this. Um, and the degree to which they did this, though, varied. And it didn't seem to be related to their proficiency level. Um, even the least proficient, Elisabetta, did it very, very well. And some of the more proficient speakers didn't do it very much. So it seems to be a matter of maybe uh, personality or, um, or how much dramatic flair you have or how much risk you want to take, you know, getting into something like this in front of an audience. 
uh, but they all did it. They all tried it. And then this is, this is important. It's coming back to where we started. You know, what does this mean about inner language competence? Inner language being that grammatical system that underlies what you do when you are making meaning. So what does it mean to be competent? Um, and what it looks like is that it looks like a variety of voices, right? That it is multiple that you've internalized and acquired voices from different people that are still infused with the personalities of the people that you learn them from. Um, it's complex, it's variable, and, and here's an important question for teachers, I think, and for language assessment people. If second language learners show in our data, and they do, that they know how to use more target-like grammatical structures, why don't they use them all the time? Right? They clearly know how to be more grammatical uh, sometimes than others. So why aren't they grammatical all the time? Right? Why don't they do that all the time? I think to answer that question, we really do need to rethink our models about what it is that learners know when they know a language. And um, we also need to think about using more than just grammar tests to get a real picture of what it is second language learners know. They're not showing us what they know on grammar tests. And that includes oral proficiency interviews, right? So as a teacher, you want, might want to think about, in your classroom, uh, inviting learners to tell us stories about compelling or funny things that happen to them and record those stories and then either by yourself or with them. Have them look at their language and look at their own grammaticality, accuracy, and fluency and talk about where does, where does this come from. Um, there's more data here. We have data to talk about this if you have questions, but we're up against it. We've used up our presentation time. It's question and answer time, but there's more that we could talk with you about. Thank you. Do you want to talk about this? Because yeah. Eric talks about this. Oh, the highlighted words. <laughs> no, this is something um, that a lot of people, uh, when we presented this, they were thinking, well, is this just memorized chunks? Is this coming from the textbook? Where are they getting this language from? And so this is a, a slide that we pull. Like, it's not from the textbook. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not memorized. And it's cause, not memorized. Because this is Pasquale's story about something that happened to him in his interaction with his grandma back home in Spanish. He's telling us in English. He's, this, and this illustrates, this is about creation, right? Being creative, right? This is not just turning on a tape recorder and playing back what my grandma said. This, this is a, this is drama. Right. Thank you for your, your talk. I'm thinking about the sort of different grammatical demands and the differences in creativity and license that there exists. So like in the narrative voice, you've got to you know, tense and aspect and all, you know, there's sort of demands to make the story make sense. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Whereas when you are in the constructed voice, I wonder if you saw examples of this, where you can construct not even what the person says, but you can just say something like, she was like, oh my god. And you're like, you're reporting a whole bunch there about her mental state, for instance, and you can get around whatever um, problems you might have with language. Right? Mm -hmm. I don't know. Could you say, it, were you able to look for differences in the linguistic demands between those two types of talk beyond uh, complexity? That would be, that's a great point. I don't know how you would do that in a systematic way to say, what, how do you compare linguistic demands? I, what you say is absolutely right. I think the whole idea of constructing that background intuitively, to me, is more, there's more demand to it. And, and the example of shifting between the tents, trying to figure out do I have all my people introduced right, and have I given the right information so you can understand. And the actual language is easy. Right, it seems to be ready made. It's packaged. It just bleh, just comes out. And I've actually seen children 
do stories just acting out the, the just just saying the voices, right? Because then it's easy. It's easy. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, we did see a lot more creative license, though, with the enacted voice. Um, this being one example, I, I don't think he said this to his grandma. I don't know. <laughs> um, it's Spanish. And, or yeah, English. and then the other, Elisaveta, uh, about the Russian shopkeepers when she was taking on those voices in English and not telling me what they said in Russian. Because really, they were not speaking English, those Russian shopkeepers. And they had to be Russian, right? So it's a representation mm -hmm. for an audience. That is stereotypical, maybe. Yeah. Funny about all else. It's clearly playing. It's clearly fun to do it. That's great. This is just terrific. Um, I, you talk about <clears throat> punchlines. Mm -hmm. Punchlines are one liners. Mm -hmm. The samples you're giving are one liners. Mm -hmm. Is there any way of, and, and that may explain why the complexity wasn't this high. Is there any way of um, eliciting extended? Um, there, this is this is extended in the sense that when you get a one liner, a one liner, a one liner, a one liner. In other words, it can be a whole series of turns, not just one turn, but what this person said, and then this person's response, and this person's, and this person's. Right. So that is more extended. It's still pretty simple, yeah. right? Because each turn is a yeah. yeah. But I mean, discourse wise, it can get complex. That's yeah. all I can Yeah, say. I'm, I mean, because you talk about the narrative voice, which is which is, which like is nature different. Yeah. Yes. needs yes. to be more complex. Yes. Yes. And you know, getting someone to tell a story in someone else's voice mm -hmm. might tell us something. I think there's a way we're analyzing it too in terms of analysis of speech units because we're just looking at um, complexity by subordination. So if there are a lot of independent clauses, they could be strung together, but they could be relatively simple in terms of that there's no subordination. So um, we didn't. So it's only really looking at how, how much subordination there is, uh, subordinate clauses there are attached to independent clauses versus just um, how many independent clauses there are in a sequence, I suppose. Now, <clears throat> I think what you're saying is right about this data, but I think the next step, there are a number of next steps that we can do in thinking about how to build on this to address some of these questions. I mean, we could gather data to try to push for more complex conversation that might go on, we might ask them to conversation, mm -hmm. for example. I mean, I think you and I have talked about this before, and I've seen you shift in your German into the voice of a beloved professor of yours, and that was pretty, pretty long chunks of discord. Right. Right. So you're, you're able, I mean, this is just in the course of telling a story, we're noticing this shift that's ongoing, right. just showing what you know is, is complex. But the whole idea that you can take on another person's whole persona and make fun of them, and Bhakti talked a lot about use of language and language to make fun of people, right? And and people do that, right? And in the process, they're, I, I'm sure their grammar shifts, but I've never seen a study about that. That would be really a fun thing. <laughs> Yeah. The example we gave was with floral or ice markers. Mm -hmm. right? um, so I'm wondering, I, I know that the quantitative results are supposed to just focus on the narrative and um, history. There's a difference, there's yeah. just a shift. So but I wonder if you look at it more qualitatively and see what kinds of errors that they are or are not making. Because I, I see an example of one of the right kind of things. So I just wonder if you looked at the nature of the error type that Yeah, we did. Um, a few of the ones that, so, so a lot of times when we were looking at errors, the same errors kind of appear in both categories. And so it's interesting when we're finding that one error appears in one but not in the other kind of thing, like the email distinction between uh, male and email. 
And so we saw that um, with uh, Jing Fei, with the plural S marking, um, we saw that with question formation, but oftentimes it just appeared that there were just far fewer errors overall. The other thing that I would say as a sociolinguist, taking that perspective, is that not everything shifts in language. There's style shifting. There's certain variants that carry social significance that learn is supposed to shift, right? And I think that's part of what's happening here. Perhaps, I mean, if we don't have enough data, we need more studies like this. I need more data. Because, yeah, one could just be a performance error, but two or three, always here, ever here, then you have a stronger argument, right? And then you still have people say, yeah, that's just one speaker. I mean, it's just like, when you're working with case study data, it's a slow accretion of trying to look at patterns of what people do and trying to understand it. I, I think the whole idea of viewing voice as including not just the grammar, not just the shift of variance, but also your tone of voice, the raise of an eyebrow to say this guy's a jerk, right, or not. <laughs> you know, there's a whole lot of communication that's going on, on verbally as well. So um, it makes me think about the idea of doing an oral proficiency test where you say, you just took this test, now take it as your teacher. Go. Right? Like, and put on another person, be another person now and do it again. Mm -hmm. Let's see if that's true. And I, I'd love to see that. <coughs> Elaine, are you saying, because that's not allowed for oral proficiency tests. <laughs> <laughs> we, we used to tell students they could make up lies as long as it was correct in French. You know, we were doing, you know, like, like I have five brothers or whatever. Yeah. So that's not another voice, though. That's just being no, like a lie. That's just being like a lie. But I mean, but, but to. But to yeah. But, you know, to try to tap into this innate ability that we have as human beings to play with language, yeah. to pretend to be someone else. And if you think about children, that's what children do. Yeah, no, I'm like, you know, I'm going to be so-and-so, I'm going to be so-and-so. So no, and courage learns to be someone else and just see what happens with that. Because I think you might be able to get more accurate language. We, <laughs> we see a little of that, like, if we watch a movie or we you know, listen to a singer and then the students try to like, you know, tap into what was going on in that movie and try to imitate it. We right. can do that in class. Yeah. Right. And I mean, in another in a couple of years we've done, Holly Myers has done some work with ITAs where she has asked them to reenact somebody else on video and, and watched how their language improves. And she's now got data where the next step is to say now, teach accounting, that same accounting lesson you did at the beginning of the course, how would this person do that lesson? Mm -hmm. And they did it, and it was, be it was, it was better. It was more even like it was more, it had elements of that <coughs> accuracy and speech, speech style. So I mean, I think it isn't just a matter of repeating what you've already heard, it is a creative process. Yeah, it's, a whole sense of the person. Yeah. it's not about shifting between forms or meanings or styles to pick up contextualization. But what you learn in the prior contextualization messages and within and you actually your own tools. So that caution and the other time is um, what would you consider contextualization and the contextualization? <laughs> of course, language socialization. <laughs> I was going to ask about when, um, when I first started teaching language, people, it was common to give kids a fake you know, name in the yeah. language. Oh, yeah. no. We kind of shifted away from that. Oh, it's like you want to speak as yourself in a language, but maybe. Maybe it helps to take on a different persona. Yeah, it, it's not contradictory. I mean, you can do both, right? I mean, that's what children do. They're, they're trying to figure out who their voice is in the first place, right? And maybe second language learners need to be free to do that, too. Yeah? It seems to me it's enhanced by multiple personas, right? Yes. And not just one. Yes. So that, yeah. so that you know, giving them one identity then that restricts them to that. Right. 
Yeah, and I have your intellectual identity and your playful identity. Well, a whole bunch of them. I mean, you know, if this is grandma, but they probably told another story quoting <laughs> somebody else, right? Right, right. And yeah. probably tell a story about Sarah and Red Nats. Okay, maybe that's a place to stop. <laughs>